thank you for tuning in. I uh, hope most of you are not laid up, but I do know that a few of you are. We want to send out prayers and love to Nicolas, um, also to Maggie Law, who is at the UNM Hospital. Uh, a terrible accident. We're praying for you, uh, sweetheart, that God just uh, heal and help you. And for the many more who just couldn't be here because of uh, issues with health or um, whatever, uh, we're praying for you. And for those of you that are tuning in across the country, welcome. Let's give them a grand welcome, would you please? Awesome. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 21. And listen, we're going to continue with the lesson that we started last week. It involves, that lesson involves groups or cliques of people that we love to hate. Look at your neighbor and say, oh, you know, groups and cliques of people that we love to hate. Albeit lazy people, you know, some of us just said, lazies, get under our skin. Oh, those lazy people. Or maybe it's the social clique, you know, those people who, you know, wear strange hats and order extremely confusing coffee drinks and, you know, all of them on, so on social media. Or maybe it's the racial clique that, that gets under our skin or an economic group that we just can't stand. Or maybe it's an academic group, you know, the cone heads that are just so brilliant and they just, you know, you ask them, how are you? And they say, smarter than you, you know, those people. Uh, you know, maybe there's the religious groups, you know, with every, everything that they say ends with a punctuation mark and, and, and an exclamation point and ugh, right? And you have to and you should, or maybe it's that political group. And everybody say, ah. As Christians, what is the right attitude that we should have towards all of those people in those groups that get under our skin, that we tend to uh, pull away from and isolate from. What sh should be our right attitude? Are you ready? Let's pray. Father, I want to say thank you for meeting us here this morning with your presence, with your word, for, Lord, creating some tension so that we can get in tune just like the guitar string. We need a little tension sometimes so we can be in tune to you. And so, Father, I pray that we would listen to your voice and that, Lord, we would embrace your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Well, in our story, we've been going through the book of Acts. And in our story, the Apostle Paul and representatives from the Gentile or non-Jewish churches in Greece and in Turkey had traveled 1,500 miles to bring financial help to the suffering Christians in Jerusalem over at the Mother Church. In fact, here's the map. So, you know, Paul had started churches in all of these areas that we talked about. And actually, uh, the church out in Jerusalem down here was suffering. There were some things that were going on in Jerusalem at the time. Persecution against Christians. There was uh, prejudice against Christians. And then a famine started. So they were actually starving. The apostle Paul was out here in Ephesus. He had started many churches. He decided that the best thing, he wanted to help them, so he decided what the best thing to do would be to have all of the churches take up some offerings, build, get some contributions so that they could take some help over to the suffering Jews in Jerusalem, the suffering church in Jerusalem. And so uh, Paul had all of the guys from each church, uh, representatives, meet him in Troas. From Troas, they came down and they traveled all the way across to Caesarea and eventually to Jerusalem with their offerings and their help for the church there. Now, guys, it was an act of true love and fellowship for these guys to bring, uh, you know, that offering. I mean, after all, Jesus had commanded this. In John chapter 13 and verse 34, we're familiar with the command. Je here's what Jesus said. Read it out loud with me. Love each other just as I have loved you. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Right? And then there's another verse that urges us like this. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2, it says this. Read it with me. Bear one another's burdens, 
and so obey the Lord's command to love, right? So go ahead and look at your neighbor and look at him and tell him, you can count on me like one, two, three. Look at him and tell him that. You can count on me like one, two, three. Now, when Paul and the representatives arrived in Jerusalem, when they got there with these offerings, they gathered together with James, Jesus' brother, John, Peter, Matthew, you know, all the apostles, they gathered together with him, and Paul began to rehearse to these disciples in Jerusalem, to, to, the, to these icons of Christianity, the men who walk with Jesus. Paul rehearsed all the wonderful things that God was doing among the Gentiles. How God had, had turned problems into platforms. How God turned riots into revivals. How God turned sinners into saints back there. He was just relaying that information, rehearsing all the things that God had done. And then each of the representatives got up from the churches out there in, in, in the mission field and they told about how Jesus had saved them. One, you know, talked about how Jesus saved them from adultery. Another talked about how Jesus saved them from addiction. Another one talked about being delivered from hate. Another one, anger. Another one, disease. Another one, divorce. Another one, depression. One of them may have even put his story to a song. He said, I wondered so aimless, life filled with sin. I didn't let my dear Savior in. Then like a blind man who God gave back his sight. Everybody, praise the Lord, I saw the light. It was awesome, right? That wasn't just a song, but it was a real life story. Well, so if that's your life story, go ahead and shout it out loud. Praise the Lord, I saw. <laughs> yeah. Now, as they, these guys were sharing with the, the, the disciples and these, these Christians who were suffering in Jerusalem, as they shared, the meeting room in Jerusalem was electric. It was filled with praise and inspiration. But then James and the Jerusalem church leaders slammed on the brakes. Everybody on this side say, Arr! Oh, it was going so good. And then all of a sudden, James and the elders slam on the brakes. They said, all this is great, Paul. All this is God's doing is great. But the Jewish believers here in Jerusalem have heard that you are teaching that Jewish laws are no longer necessary. And everybody on this side say, no, no. Sound convincing, right? Well, what Paul had been preaching and what they were saying was actually true. We covered this last week. You see, because of Jesus, Old Testament laws, rules, rituals are no longer necessary. Circumcision, Sabbath, sacrifice, Priests are obsolete. They, they have been superseded by Jesus. Here's the New Testament truth we established last week. Everybody say it. Jesus is all I need. Say it again. Jesus is all I need. So they accused Paul of doing something, and he was. And he was actually right in doing so. But not everyone was on the same page. All those Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, as James was saying, hey, listen, they are not on the same page with you. The difference in opinions, in views, and positions was resulting in anger, in hostility, and in division. Let's go ahead and read the text. Acts chapter 21 and verse 20. Here's what it says. And they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, who have become believers. And they are all zealous for the law. They're still holding on to Old Testament law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought to, not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then? Everybody say, What? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. 
We have four men who have taken a vow, a religious vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their ceremonial expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. So, Paul was asked to extend some consideration. Hey, listen, you know, you've been, we've, been, we've heard that you've been preaching for them, uh, for, Jew, for people to abandon the law, that they don't, they're no longer under the Old Testament law. But, listen, when you're here, we're hoping that you would extend some consideration by participating in some Jewish rituals. It, it, would, it, would, it will ease some tensions here, and it will also build some bridges. And everybody say, yeah. But some Christians won't consider being flexible. You know that, right? Some Christians will not consider being flexible. You know, you would think you were asking them to donate a kidney, you know, by being flexible. <laughs> what? No way. Everybody said, what? No way. I mean, some Christians act like Jonah when God asked him to preach to the Assyrians in Nineveh. Then they say, no way, not going to do it. Everybody do it like this. Everybody, no way, not going to do it. Huh? Some Christians do that. They're asked to be a little flexible, but they, oh, no, no, no. I mean, Jonah had some strong religious and political views. And he was not about to compromise them by taking that message of mercy and grace to people that he loved to hate, right? The, he, he basically said, the people on that side of the aisle are wrong. They're blind. They're haters. They're deplorable. They're socialists. They're crazy, right? I detest the very thought of them. I'm glad Paul didn't take that approach when he was asked. In fact, Paul followed Jesus' lead. See, when they said, hey, listen, would you go ahead? I know that, you don't, that, that you know, we're not under the law anymore, but would you just kindly, so that we don't have all of this tension, we don't have all this disruption, we don't have all this division, would you go ahead and follow through, participate with this ceremonial thing that's going on? No way! No, Paul didn't do that. Paul instead followed Jesus' lead. See, as I said last week, Jesus' passion wasn't religion, wasn't politics or patriotism, but everybody said out loud, who, who is it? What's Jesus' passion? People. Say it again. What? People. I'm going to say it again. Jesus' passion wasn't religion, politics, or patriotism, but it was People. Say it out loud with me about who? People. We mature Christians tend to become, you know, all Grand Torino and everything, if you know what I mean. Prejudice, judgmental, bias. You know, like the guy who fired his masseuse. He said she rubbed him the wrong way. Huh? Yep, we can be so critical. In fact, we won't. Some of us won't even consider blemished lemons. Say it out loud. What? Blemished lemons. Last Sunday, Albert shared several bushels of citrus fruit from his brother's orchard in Arizona. I noticed there's some more out there again this, this week. Well, as we were cleaning up to go home last week, I found some rejects that were left behind on the bottom of the bushels. Runts. Blemished. They were discolored, dehydrated, deformed. Here's a picture of them right there. They, you left them behind. You discriminated. Take that one home. You discriminated. Well, we can be thankful that Jesus isn't like that. 
He looked past our blemishes, our flaws, our inconsistencies, our deformities, and not only picked us, but he paid the most extravagant price for us. His precious blood. Say it out loud. His precious blood. He did. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says this. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while, everybody, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 it says, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. Everybody out loud. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. That is, that awesome, yeah. Great place to applause, because that's what he did. During his earthly ministry, Jesus crossed some religious, political, and cultural boundaries to reach those who are on the other side. Like, in the story, like the story that's in Luke chapter 14, when a diseased man came to Jesus for healing on the Sabbath day, the religious laws prohibited any work on the Sabbath day. I mean, guys, you couldn't collect an egg from the hen house, much less boil it. You know what I mean? The, the laws were against it. You couldn't doctor an ailment, much less you know, cure it. But Jesus did it anyway. Everybody say it out loud. Jesus did it anyway. He healed that guy, that diseased guy, even though it was a Sabbath. He reached over that particular religious boundary. The religious leaders ripped Jesus a new one for healing on the Sabbath. They were rigid. They were strict. They were obnoxious, legalistic. To which Jesus replied, saying this. Everybody said, Orale! Well, that's not exactly what Jesus said. And if you're, you know, and if you're not, what does Orale mean? I, I, I hear it, but it means, come on, man! Everybody said, come on, man! That's what Jesus said. Luke chapter 14, verse 5, here's what Jesus said. If your donkey or ox falls into a pit, will you leave him there to die just because it's the Sabbath day? Now you can say it. Oh, right? Now you get it. See, Jesus is willing to cross cultural, religious, and political boundaries to rescue a donkey that has fallen into the pit or an elephant that has fallen into the pit. Wait for it. Wait for it. You're going to get it. Ha ha. Right? Jesus is willing to cross cultural and religious and political boundaries to rescue Jews or Gentiles who are stuck in the mud. I'll ask you to consider the woman at the well that Jesus ran into. I mean, Khloe Kardashian has a better reputation than this woman. And yet, Jesus crossed, reached over that boundary to bring salvation, living water to her, to bring forgiveness, to bring restoration, to bring peace, while she was still a sinner. Isn't that awesome, guys? Yeah. Okay, how about when Jesus, how about, listen, Jesus also did it for Matthew, approaching him at his tax booth. I mean, Charlie Sheen has more morals than Matthew. And yet Jesus approached. In fact, the Bible says when it's talking about him, that when he went to the middle of the town, he was looking around like he was looking for someone. And that's when he saw Matthew and made a beeline to him. A guy who was, <laughs> had less morals than Charlie Sheen. And he crossed the boundary. 
All the other Jews had written this guy off, had struck a line through his name. Him of whom we do not speak. Jesus said, come and follow me. Wow. Or consider Zacchaeus. You know, Zacchaeus, the, the, the other guy who was a mob boss. I mean, El Chapo was more righteous than this guy. And Jesus said, today I'm going to eat at your house. He crossed the bound. What? You're inviting yourself over to El Chapo's house? Come on, Jesus. These people were considered taboo. But there was no place Jesus wouldn't go and no person he wouldn't touch. Yeah. And whenever Jesus did reach over, he didn't criticize or condemn those people. He showed consideration and respect in hope of reaching them with the only agenda that really matters. This agenda right here, everybody say it aloud, salvation. Say it with me, salvation. That's what Jesus did. He didn't reach over and show contempt or criticism. He didn't reach over and condemn, show them condemnation. He reached over and showed them the only agenda that really matters. It's called, everybody say it again, salvation. Paul took the same approach in this situation that we're in in the story. He went along with James' suggestion to participate in, in the ritual ceremony. Paul wasn't agreeing with the religious ritual. He wasn't endorsing it. He was merely finding a way to connect with those on the other side. In fact, Paul later explained it like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 20, here's what he said. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I'm not subject to that law. I did so, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law. Everybody out loud? So I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. In other words, I don't, I don't participate in their sin. But I, I still identify with them. I, I, I still try to connect with them as to bring them to Christ. He said, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to, everybody say it, save some. Compassion and consideration goes a lot further than condescension and contempt. Jesus said, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Say it out loud with me. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But unfortunately, some Christians are more likely to show their fangs, especially over immigration or impeachment or gun control or making America great. Those are strong opinions. There are strong opinions on both sides. We should be, listen, we should be patriotic. We should. But we need to remember, we weren't called to save America. We were called to save Americans or people. And we're not called to save them from government, but from eternal destruction. It's people that are important to God. Let's say it out loud. People are important to God. In fact, remember I told you about Jonah who had these political and patriotic views and he said, I'm not going to go over there and preach to them. You just might save them. No way. Let them, let them die and rot in hell for all I care. Well, here's what God told Jonah about his bias, about his prejudice. 
Here's what he said. Everybody said out loud. Change your attitude. Say it again. Change your attitude. Well, those weren't his exact words, but Jonah chapter 4, here's what God told him. Verse 11. God told him, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? In so many words, the Lord told Jonah, just because you despise them doesn't mean I do. The person next to you is more precious to God than your political or patriotic or religious view. More important than your radical view. See, throughout the Bible, it tells us this, that God desires all men to be saved. That means Republicans and Democrats, citizens and undocumented. It means the Hannity's and the Hillary's. So before you sport an attitude or start an argument with someone on a different side, ask yourself if you are reflecting compassion or contempt. Are you acting like Jesus or a judge? We shouldn't allow our biases to keep us from loving and reaching those on the other side. Paul, in fact, shared about someone who reached over some boundaries to help him. Now, we won't have time to read through all of Paul's testimony in chapter 22. So I'm going to give you the highlights of chapter 22 in Acts. Paul, uh, the, the, the story goes, Paul had just been attacked and beaten by a mob of religious men. He had gone to the temple, was going through the, the, the ceremonial rites with these guys. He was, he, he, you know, he was going along with it. He was going through the, the law, keeping the law, so that he might win a few. So that he might be able to connect with those Jews who were holding on to the law. He might still be able to present Jesus to them and bring them to, uh, to the Lord, right? So he was in there and all of a sudden somebody recognized him and they thought that he had bring some of those Gentiles with them in the temple. I mean, that is Oh my gosh, everybody said OMG, OMG, right? So they started beating him. They caught him, they pulled him outside of the temple, and they started beating him within an inch of his life. Had it not been from the Praetorian guard who came and rescued him, they would have beat him to death. But then Paul, being taken by the Praetorian Guard, is going up the steps, and they're going to take him over to uh, the Antonio Fortress, where the, where the guard you know, keeps the prisoners, because they thought this guy, they thought Paul was a terrorist from Egypt, is what they thought. So they're going to take him, and, and while he's on the steps, and he's overlooking the temple area, he asks the Praetorian, can I speak to the crowd? Okay. So Paul says, First of all, men and brethren, I was just like you. He identified with these guys who just beat him. He said, I was just like you. I was once exactly like you, zealous for the law. He said, heck, I was even more zealous than you were. I, 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 I was imprisoning and, and killing Christians. But then... The resurrected Jesus that those Christians had preached about. He confronted me. He appeared to me. I was on my way to Damascus to bring some of the Christians who had run from Jerusalem to hide over there. I was about to go over there and bring them back to be prisoned, to be incarcerated, to be, you know, given the death penalty for treason. And the resurrected Jesus appeared to me. He stopped me dead in his tracks. He blinded me. I sat in darkness until a man by the name of Ananias came. 
Well, according to the record, when Jesus instructed Ananias to go to a street called Straight and help a man by the name of Paul, Ananias, like Jonah, protested. He said, no way. He said, Allah, what? no way. He, he, he told God, I know this guy. I hate his stinking guts. He makes me vomit. He is the scum between my toes. But Jesus reminded Ananias that our opinions and judgments are irrelevant. Paul was a man that Jesus loved and wanted to save. So Ananias crossed over all the political, religious, and patriotic boundaries. He walked into that house in the street called Straight that he was told to go. And he cried out, Brother Paul? Everybody say it. Brother Paul. Brother. Say it again. When no one would touch this guy with a 10-foot pole. When nobody would consider him because of who he was and what he had done. It wasn't that he was a horrible sinner, a detestable wretch. He was religious. He was, in his eyes, righteous. He was, in his eyes, God's gift to, you know, to, to Judaism. He was doing what he thought was right in trying to snuff out these Christians. He was trying to keep purity in his religion. Nobody wanted to touch him. When he heard the word, said again, Brother Paul, brother. Tears may have streamed down Paul's cheeks as he told them how Ananias called him brother. How Ananias prayed for him when no one would touch him. He told about how the scales fell off of his eyes and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The message today is don't be too biased too critical, too rigid to reach out to those on the other side. Here's the last verse for this morning. Jude chapter, or excuse me, it's only one chapter, verse 22 and 23. Read it with me. Try to help those who argue against you. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save some by snatching them as from the very flames of hell itself. And as for others, help them to find the Lord by being kind to them. Wow. Well, that was a good place for you to applause, but I, I, that's okay. Because I can feel the tension. Sometimes like when you're tuning that guitar string. You know what I'm saying? We need the tension in order to be in, on, on key. I know sometimes when I tune my guitar, I think it's going to break. Oh my gosh. But that string was built that way. It was built to withstand the tension so that it can play the tune of the master. You were built to withstand a little tension so that your life can be in tune with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So sometimes we leave here like Rocky Balboa. And sometimes we leave here reflecting God help me. It's still a Rocky Balboa moment because it's the Lord is the one that's going like this because they got it. They get it. They're practicing it. Do you believe it? Did you learn something? Let's all stand. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to 
just say thank you for your word. It helps us recognize the right attitude we should have. When it comes to others, when it comes to others' beliefs and others' views and others' agendas, Lord, I pray that we would be the Christians we need to be. That we would stand, share, love, and show compassion. And Lord, that they would see you through us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen.